today on Grace to You. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Christ who is our life. He is in his church, not in the building, but he has taken up residence in the people. If you have Christ, you have the spirit of Christ. Christ cannot, will not forsake his true church. And when you commune with the true and living church, you're communing with the true and living Christ. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's been a part of the sadness of ministry to see so much misrepresentation of the teaching of the Word of God, so much bad theology, so much bad practice, so many scandals and all of that in the church. And one would wonder what would be a way that the Lord could just sort of bring judgment on that. Well, in my lifetime, I've never seen anything anywhere near as effective as this COVID situation. It has shut down more bad churches than anything ever could have done. <laughs> Narcissistic leadership. And the Lord has sifted and purged His church. Judgment begins at the house of God. That's not to say Grace Church is perfect. We know better than that. But I will say this church is faithful, faithful to the Word of God because the Word of God dominates our life and our thought and our conversation and our conduct and our relationships. What really matters in the world is the church of Jesus Christ, and the church needs to be the church. But there were a lot of unfaithful churches that needed to shut down. Judgment has come in a lot of ways. I have been far more terrified by false doctrine than I have by any virus. Far more damage is done in this world by false teaching, false churches, scandalous pastors, bad theology, churches advocating things that blaspheme the name of God. And I think it's a separating of the true church from the false. Now we know how the Lord cares for His true church, Psalm 91. We know the Lord is committed to His true church. He says to the true church, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says to the true church, in the world you will have trouble. Be of good courage, I have overcome the world. He says to the true church, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He says to His true church, through the Apostle Paul, we always triumph in Christ. What has happened has certainly, among other things, in part been a judgment on false churches and weak churches and unfaithful churches. And it has been a purging time, and it has featured a spotlight on the faithful. They have been put under duress, not just us, but many churches. Some pastors put in jail for being faithful, all kinds of constraints, all kinds of assaults. But the faithful have been faithful, and the world has seen it. You know, the Lord never hesitates to judge openly. Sometimes you hear people say, well, some of these bad things that are happening in the church are, uh, are, are really concerning to me because the world is watching. You bet. And God is going to judge His church right in front of them. It's not going to do it secretly. 
God has always judged an unfaithful people openly. His judgment is never hidden. And it's still going on as we see scandal after scandal after scandal connected to churches and leadership. It's all exposed. This whole issue of social justice compounded with this epidemic has cast a light on the behavior of churches and leaders. But in the midst of it all, we have seen the hand of the Lord in a mighty way, haven't we? And the question that I I want to direct your attention to today is, what is the Lord doing in His true church? What is He doing in His true church? There's no need to speculate on that. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. This is one of the most magnificent, glorious, dramatic, instructive, Christ-exalting chapters in all of Holy Scripture. Revelation is, as you know, identified in the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation reveals Jesus Christ. When you think of Revelation, you most immediately think of the revelation of Christ in judgment coming in the future and in His return to judge and establish His kingdom, and then the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that wraps up the book of Revelation. You think about the future. You think about the future. But the book of Revelation is not all about the future. It's not all about the future. The first chapter is, in fact, about the present. Suffice it to say, this is a picture of Christ in His church. That is crystal clear. John is given a vision. He looks at the seven lampstands, verse 13, and there he sees the Son of Man. The Son of Man is described in detail. We know who it is. It is the living one, verse 18, who was dead and is alive forevermore and has the keys of death and Hades. It is the very one named back in verse 5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. The one who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood. The one who made us to be a kingdom, priests to His God and Father. The one to whom we give glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The one who is coming with clouds and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, no doubt a reference to the Jewish nation, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him, so it is to be. Amen. We have a picture here of Christ in His church. This is the only picture in the whole of Scripture of Christ in His church. And when you look at the church in the times in which we live, as I suppose even the Apostle Paul did and everybody between him and me, you could be very discouraged and disillusioned. Paul was. He was heartbroken. He was brought to tears by the issues that the church demonstrated as evidence of their disobedience and unfaithfulness. And we who preach and we who shepherd the flock of God are continually burdened by the care of the church. This is not administrative. This is spiritual care. We have to give an account to God for the flock that we shepherd. So what do we long for? Well, we long that people in the church would have deep fellowship with Christ, not something superficial or shallow. We desire for people who are the the church to see power over temptation, trials, sin. 
We pray for them to be faithful, to be strong, to be victorious. And of course, we desire their holiness, their virtue. We desire the purity of the church doctrinally and behaviorally. We desire that they understand the authority of the Word of God and that they be sanctified by it. We long for godly leaders to set a holy example for God's people. We desire that the church be protected from unholy satanic deception that comes from false teachers on the inside and the outside. And we are concerned that the bride of Christ truly reflect His holy glory. So many will be drawn to His beauty and His salvation. That's what a genuine shepherd cares for. The fellowship of the church, the power of the church, the purity of the church, the obedience to the Word of God of the church, the example of godly leaders in the church, the protection of the church, and the reflection of the glory of God through the church. That's what we want to see because that's what our Lord desires. But life can be very difficult and the church can bring immense discouragement. We could start with John. John's an old man now. John is at the end of that first century, maybe around 96 A.D. He has every reason to be discouraged. He had lived to see Jerusalem destroyed, not exalted, not elevated, but destroyed, and destroyed at the hands of pagan Romans. He had lived to see a bloodbath. Depending on which historian you believe, certainly hundreds of thousands of Jews were massacred in Jerusalem by the Romans. And must have been asking himself the question, I thought when the Messiah came, Jerusalem would be exalted. And the enemies of God would be destroyed and the people of God would be saved. The Romans also did a mop-up operation through the rest of the land of Israel, and they basically targeted 985 villages and towns and went through and massacred the populations there and destroyed everything. He had also outlived his fellow apostles who had been martyred. He knew that they had all gone on to glory. Almost all of them at the hands of Christ-haters. And he is there as a criminal. He tells you why he's there. He was there because of his faithfulness, verse 9, to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So they didn't kill this apostle. They exiled him to essentially what was a prison colony. What questions, what eschatological questions were arising in his mind? Where was the kingdom? It was all going the wrong way. You say, well, there were churches, weren't there? Yes, there were churches, and in particular, John had oversight of seven of them in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. And they're named in verse 11, and they, by the way, starting at Ephesus, show the postal route through Asia Minor. Starting from Ephesus, the church that was first established by Paul, other churches were established all along the postal route. But there was some discouragement with those churches because Ephesus had left its first love. And the Lord is about to give John a letter threatening that church that the Lord Himself is going to shut it down. 
Pergamos was idolatrous and immoral, and they weren't even out of the first century yet. And the Lord said He's going to fight against that church. And Thyatira was compromised by sin and worldliness and also faced judgment. Sardis was dead, and Laodicea was so false as to be nauseating to the Lord Himself. It's a bleak picture, really, for John. He's the only apostle left. All the defection in five out of the seven churches. They had succumbed to all the compromises that the world throws at the church, not unlike today, endless ways you can buy the world's compromises, whether it's liberalism, legalism, division, racism, immorality, carnality, materialism, bad doctrine, whatever it is. So John is not unlike Isaiah. He needs some clarity. What is happening in the church? And herein lies the reason that I find this chapter so encouraging. Because I feel like John, who had to feel like Isaiah, who had to feel like Elijah. I only I am left. I was on the island called Patmos, and I was there because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I'd been exiled there. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We know one thing, it was a Sunday, the Lord's day. What do you mean, John, you were in the Spirit? Well, I don't know if I can say it any other way. I was not in the flesh. I was in the Spirit. I was in some spiritual zone one Sunday, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Here's a discouraged old man sitting in rags. There's a cave on the Isle of Patmos that goes way back in tradition as one of the places where John, no doubt, spent time. I've sat in that cave, an amazing experience. In the midst of this discouragement on a Sunday, heaven opens up. He is taken out of the normal perceptions of time and space, and he's in the Spirit. In other words, he's about to have a spiritual revelation. And it begins with a voice like a sound of a trumpet, blasting to get his attention. There were loud trumpets at Sinai. This is that kind of loud trumpet that's intended to get his attention. And he's about to find out why he's not dead. He's old, but he's not dead because he's not done. Verse 11, he is told by this loud voice, write in a book what you see. You're about to write all the visions that are going to come to you all the way through the end of the book of Revelation, make seven copies and send them to the seven churches. And in those copies, there will be letters to each of those individual churches. And there will be the rest of the visions that you are given. Write the book of Revelation. Seven golden lampstands then appear in verse 12. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and he saw seven golden lampstands. What are they in indicating? Well, down in verse 20, the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches. So they're symbols of the seven churches, and because seven is number of completion, they're symbols of all churches in all periods of time. 
These lampstands are portable lampstands. They had little oil lamps, a little jar filled with oil, They'd put a wick in it and light it, and they would put it on a lampstand. It would be elevated like you elevate a lamp to get the light above where you need it so you can see. He sees the lampstands, and then this is the most important moment. In the middle of the lampstands, in verse 13, I saw one like the Son of Man. He saw Christ. This is Christ in the middle of the lampstands. The lampstands represent the church, the light in the world. This is Christ in His church. And the question in John's mind is, does he care about his church? Does he know about the condition of his church? Does he understand what's going on and how bad it is? And John had oversight of those seven churches. Does he understand what's coming from the outside and what's coming up from the inside that can do so much damage? What is the Lord doing in His church now? Creation is finished. Atonement is finished. His life on earth is finished. So what's He doing now? Well, clearly, He's moving in His church. The lampstands are golden, which speaks of the costliness of the church purchased with His own blood. Seven churches, again, speak of the symbolism of the whole church. And John sees Christ in His church, and that's the setup for understanding this incredible passage. What I'm saying to you is the Lord is in His true church. That's the first point I want you to notice. He inhabits His church. In the middle of the lampstands, verse 13, I saw one like a son of man. Son of man is taken from Daniel 7, 13 and 14, where the prophet Daniel says, one like a son of man, speaking of the Messiah, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people and nations and men of every language would serve Him, and His kingdom is everlasting and will never be destroyed. So Daniel introduces us to Son of Man as a messianic title. John's first encouragement is, the Lord is in His church. He inhabits His church. He has redeemed His church. He owns His church by the purchase of blood. He lives in His church. He is the one who said, Matthew 8, 28, 20, Lo, I'm with you always, right? Lo, I'm with you always. Or John 14, 18, I will not leave you. Or John 14, 23, if anyone loves Me, I will make My abode with him. Or Colossians 3.11, Christ is all and in all. No matter how the church struggles, the true church, no matter how it vacillates, the Son of Man is alive in the midst of His true church. He brings heaven to earth. And when you commune with the true and living church, you're, true, you're communing with the true and living Christ. I love what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says, Christ who is our life. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He is in His church, not in the building, but He has taken up residence in the people. If you have Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ, Romans 8, 9, living in you. Christ cannot, will not forsake His true church. John says that we have fellowship with Him and with the Father. This is communion, partnership, 
and it is unbreakable. You could never be out of fellowship with the Lord. People used to talk like that. Uh, are you out of fellowship with the Lord? That's impossible. If you are a Christian, Christ is in you, you are in Christ, that's forever. So I want to encourage you folks, whatever you see that's going wrong is purging, but the Lord is alive in His true church, which means in true believers. A few years ago, we started Grace Reaches Out, which was to take uh, five or six hundred of my most significant and important sermons and translate them into other languages. Translation, especially of the Word of God, is exciting because you can bridge gaps between people. You can communicate to people in other cultures and other languages. You can bring to them, especially when it's the Word of God, things that are valuable for their lives, things that will save them, will sanctify them, will draw them to God. This is not only uh, an opportunity to reach out to those that don't know God, to those that need the Gospel, uh, but also to reach out to the church and to give tools that would better equip them to serve God and to do it in a worshipful manner like He requires us to do in Scripture. The preaching of the Word of God that started at the pulpit of Grace Community Church ends up somewhere in the world in, a, in another language. And with just, this might surprise you to hear, but with just uh, eight or ten languages, you cover almost 80% of the planet. Translation of biblical doctrine of biblical truth, biblical teaching, will give them that foundation. It will form for them that paradigm. It will teach them who is God? How do I know Him? How can I love Him? What does He require of me? The need for true biblical teaching, the need of the true Bible, in a sense, it's massive. One of the exciting parts of the Grove Ministry is seeing how God has led in various ways, to which languages we would translate, the translators that we would choose to do the work, the voices who would be voicing the sermons. We know that these sermons will go beyond us, and we don't know what the Lord is going to do with this, uh, but it is thrilling to think of the, the potential effects and what the Word of God could accomplish uh, even beyond the English-speaking world and, and to see the truth of God proclaimed faithfully. This is the fastest track to spread the teaching of the Word of God across the planet. Grace Reaches Out is just an extension, one more way to extend that Bible teaching ministry to millions more people around the world. To partner with Grace Reaches Out in unleashing God's truth one verse at a time, Give our operators a call at 888-57-GRACE. That's 888-57-GRACE. Or visit our website, gty.org. Your prayers and financial support allow us to continue reaching hearts and minds with the truth found only in the pages of Scripture. We'll see you next week for another episode of Grace to You with John MacArthur.